Hello, jesters and jackalopes. My name is Tibi's Guy, and way back in the long ago, dark before times, when dinosaurs roamed the earth and the internet sounded like a younger and possibly uncorrupted version of me sat down to watch his favorite cartoon on Saturday morning TV in 1995. Batman the Animated Series. And as the dastardly Joker commits his latest hilarious caper against the citizens of Gotham City, he's assisted by his rotating cast of sycophantic henchmen. Obviously, comics and superhero cartoons have tons of these interchangeable nobodies lying around for the hero to punch and then forget about by the next episode. Even as a tiny little eight-year-old, I understood instinctively that none of these people matter. They don't have stories or names or narrative arcs, and if they show up in more than one episode at all, it's probably just because the animators didn't have the budget to come up with a new character design. So when this random nobody red and white clown girl shows up in the episode Joker's Favor, I, naturally, didn't really bother to think much about her after the episode was over. After all, it's not like she was ever gonna show up again. Right? <laughs> Harley Quinn was never really supposed to be a supervillain. This is true both in her own story, where she's a psychiatrist who gets turned to a life of crime by the manipulations of the Joker, and in her production history as a character as well. In the first episode where she appears, Joker's Favor, the Joker is planning to crash a party honoring police commissioner Jim Gordon. Part of the gag involves someone jumping out of a fake cake in order to immobilize the entire ballroom with a paralyzing gas. Early in production, the writers decided that having the Joker do it himself would be a little bit too weird, so they invented another character to do the jumping out of the cake for him. Since the role of jumping out of a cake in order to surprise a man on some special occasion is usually given to a young attractive woman, that's the character they designed. An incidental, pretty little clown-themed sidekick to enable the Joker's cake-jumping capers. Eventually, the decision was made that it would still be funnier to have the Joker himself jump out of the cake, but the clown girl stayed in anyway. Writer Paul Dini had found that she made a good dynamic with the Joker and was more interesting than the generic henchmen that otherwise populated the show. Harley would show up fairly infrequently in the animated series, but the idea of the Joker having a girlfriend caused her role to rapidly expand. In most episodes, she merely acts like another of the Joker's henchmen, typically portrayed as relatively dim-witted, a little bit ditzy, and helplessly sycophantic and devoted to the clown prince of crime. Man, he was a demented, abusive, psychotic maniac. Yeah, I'm really good at this. By the end of season two, we begin to see Harley Moore as a full-fledged character all on her own, and she even gets an episode focused on her, Harley and Ivy, which also establishes perhaps her most iconic relationship with another villain in the DC Comics universe. In this episode, the Joker is an asshole to Harley and kicks her out, and she accidentally runs into Poison Ivy while they're both trying to rob the same museum. Harley crashes with Ivy, and they immediately establish their odd couple dynamic, with Harley the ditzy goofball and Poison Ivy as the more serious-minded, but ultimately also a much more caring, responsible part of the relationship, trying to break Harley out of her toxic infatuation with the Joker and taking on a sort of concerned older sister role to the younger supervillain. This is also the first episode that really explicitly frames the relationship between Harley and the Joker as an abusive domestic relationship, with the Joker explicitly becoming annoyed that Harley hasn't come back yet when the hideout isn't cleaned up and the food isn't on the table and he can't find his socks. By the end of the episode, Harley's pattern of alternately mooning over getting betrayed by hating and then falling back in love with the Joker is fairly well established, and it'll remain a consistent part of her characterization throughout her run on the original animated series. By season three, we get another episode centered around Harley, Harlequinade. In this episode, the Joker has stolen essentially a nuclear bomb and is threatening to set it off under Gotham. Batman enlists Harley Quinn to help him try and track the Joker down. This episode introduces the idea that Harley used to be a brilliant psychiatrist and starts establishing a dynamic between her and the Dark Knight outside of the Joker's influence. It marks the first time that we get to see through Harley's ditzy blonde act, showcasing her intelligence and knowledge of psychology as she pretends to double-cross Batman in order to trick a whole room of bad guys into giving 
giving Robin more time to free the Dark Knight. Later in Season 3, in the episode Harley's Holiday, Harley is let out on probation from Arkham Asylum, having gone through full rehabilitation. The episode is mostly played for comedy as Harley attempts to reconnect with a normal life, but does so while, you know, having a couple of laughing hyenas drag her down the street on roller skates, and being mistaken for a shoplifter in a women's clothing store, she coincidentally runs into Bruce Wayne and Bruce Wayne's girlfriend, whom she semi-accidentally abducts and takes on a high-speed chase across Gotham. The episode tries to make a point about how difficult it can be to rebuild a life after you've been through what you might call extraordinary circumstances, which goes into building a dynamic between her and Batman. As Harley puts it, she's had a really bad day, and even though she tried to be good, everything blew up in her face, and by the end of the episode, Batman hands her a dress that she had actually tried to pay for when she was mistaken for a shoplifter and tells her, I know what it's like to try and rebuild a life. I had a bad day too, once. The definitive animated series episode about Harley and the Joker, though, is the season 4 episode, Mad Love. Its storyline was originally thought to be far too dark to put in a children's cartoon, so it was adapted into a comic, which was then later on adapted back into an episode of the series, when the creators felt confident that the series had been successful enough for long enough that they could get away with it. This episode is both the most explicitly sexualized portrayal of Joker and Harley's relationship, and also depicts his physical violence towards her in most explicit terms. This is the first episode to truly dive deep into Harley's backstory, showing her first encounter with the Joker as a psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum, showing how he manipulates her by pretending to open up to her emotionally. It took me nearly three months to set up a session. I studied all his tricks and gimmicks and felt I was ready for anything. You know, my father used to beat me up pretty badly. Anything except that. In an attempt to win the Joker's favor, Harley takes a plan that the Joker could never figure out how to make work, and uses her knowledge as a psychologist to manipulate the Dark Knight into falling for a trap. She pretends that she's seen the error of her ways and wants to do right by turning herself and the Joker in. Won't you please come save me, Batman? Save me from myself. The exact kind of cry that the Dark Knight can never ignore. So, having fallen for the trap, Batman is hung upside down in chains over a tank of hungry piranha, with only Harley Quinn there to gloat about how now finally she and the Joker are gonna be together with Batman out of the picture. As Batman admits later in the episode, Harley has got him. His only chance of getting out is to get a more incompetent criminal to take over control of the situation. No! He told me things, secret things he never told anyone! Was it his line about the abusive father? Or the one about the runaway mom. He's gained a lot of sympathy with that one. Stop it! You're making me confused! Harley, reduced to her insecurities, calls the Joker, who sees his girlfriend having a lot more success at capturing the Dark Knight than him, and reacts in the most predictable way possible. Harley! Hi, Puddin! You're just in time to see the... The Joker, in a fit of jealous rage, beats Harley and throws her out of a window, attempting to kill her, and then immediately proceeds to try and use Harley's plan to kill the Dark Knight, but he screws it up because of his massively inflated ego. She almost had me, you know. Arms and legs chained, dizzy from the blood rushing to my head. I had no way out other than convincing her to call you. I knew your massive ego would never allow anyone else the honor of killing me. Though I have to admit, she came a lot closer than you ever did. Puddin. By the end of the episode, Harley is back in Arkham Asylum, resolving to herself that now, this time, finally it's over. She's gonna leave him. She's never gonna run with the Joker again. Until she sees that he has sent her a rose with a get well card. And that little act of pretend affection. <sighs> well... Harley shows up in a number of other episodes in the animated series, and due to her growing popularity as a character, she also ends up crossing over into shows like Static Shock, Justice League Animated, and even an implied cameo on Batman Beyond. Probably because of the long arc of deepening characterization that Harley followed during the original Batman the Animated Series, she ended up becoming a breakout hit character from that particular show. And because of that popularity, Harley went on to appear in a hell of a lot of... 
We started this discussion with Batman the Animated Series both because that's where Harley Quinn originates, and also because the Animated Series is one form in which it's actually possible to chart the evolution and storyline of a character. Modern day superhero comics, however, are an infinite abyss of lore where canon and continuity go to die. It would be quite literally impossible to fully chart the many different cameos, many different series inclusions, many different half series and one shots, alternate universes, alternate timelines and alternate dimensions that Harley Quinn has appeared in in the DC Extended Universe in the 25 years since her character was first created. So what we're going to have to do in this section is narrow things down to the stuff that seems to have had the most staying power, the parts of Harley's character that seem to survive through multiple editors, writers, timelines and reboots. So Harley's comics in general, especially early on, hew pretty close to the original animated series interpretation. Brilliant psychiatrist, horrifying abusive relationship with the Joker, friend of Poison Ivy, the lot. But because comics, especially Western comics, as a medium, lend themselves a lot better to internal monologue and access to a character's direct thinking, we get much more insight into Harley the person and her own self-awareness about the situations that she's in. Because the comics are also about her, they also have a tendency to try and push her character further than they ever do in the animated series, where Harley gets little vignettes, but rarely gets to move on as a character. So, in the very first issue of Harley Quinn, the monthly comic that Harley gets all to herself, the story begins with Harley breaking the Joker out of Arkham Asylum, eventually realizing that he's a murderous bastard when he tries to kill her, and deciding that she's done with him. And the Joker mostly stays out of Harley Quinn's solo books. They tend to focus more on her relationships with the Bat Family, Poison Ivy, Catwoman, and the various other heroes and villains that hang around Gotham City especially. The Joker's effect on Harley, though, remains with her pretty much in all of her incarnations. For example, in her original comic book run, she occasionally has conversations with a shoulder angel and shoulder devil that take the shape of Harleen Quinzel, that is, the psychiatrist version of Harley Quinn, and the Joker. And especially the original comic plays with the idea that Harley isn't quite capable of seeing the world as it is. She sees everything through a kind of cartoonified filter where everything she gets up to is just harmless fun, no matter how many corpses she leaves in her wake. And to be fair, a lot of what Harley Quinn gets up to in her solo books is, relatively speaking, fairly harmless fun, at least by supervillain standards. Harley's characterization frequently teeters over into anti-hero territory, where she's perfectly happy to knock over a bank or rob some of Gotham's wealthiest criminals, but she's equally likely to try and save a puppy. In one notable storyline, she takes it upon herself to play romantic matchmaker for two FBI agents who are trying to chase her down, going so far as to even murder one of her own loyal henchmen when he gets in the way of her plans to have them have a meet-cute. And that particular tension between comedy on one side and tragedy on the other underlies a lot of the storylines that Harley Quinn goes through, at least in her own solo books. A number of her stories are patterned around either extremely serious subject matter and story going on, undercut with slapstick and banter from Harley herself, or rather lighthearted story material undercut by the essential tragedy and trauma that underpins a lot of Harley's character. This is somewhat, albeit a lot less true, in Harley's other most notable outing as a character, Suicide Squad. Suicide Squad as a franchise has um, a certain obsession with edginess, like a lot of blood and gore and betrayals and backstabbings and evil people saying cool things before doing evil things to other evil people. And so the fun, emotionally driven, rather lighthearted version of Harley Quinn doesn't really work in this particular universe. So in the Suicide Squad books, Harley Quinn is less the tragic clown character and somewhat closer to a direct female counterpart to the Joker, a dangerous, violent psychopath who kills without compliance function in the service of whatever she happens to be believing in at the time. For example, when she hears that the Joker has apparently been skinned alive, she escapes the Suicide Squad, hunts down her former boss at Arkham Asylum, forces her to tell Harley where the Joker's skin is being kept, and then slits her throat with a straight racer. After that, she incapacitates Deadshot, puts the Joker's flayed face skin over Deadshot's head, and proceeds to have a conversation with it, including the insinuation that with the Joker's skin on Deadshot's face, she sure would like to have sex with him. So, you know, that's the level of of a dark and gritty and edgy that we're dealing with here. Now, I haven't read that much of Suicide Squad because, to be quite honest, I find it quite tedious. But given that it is an ensemble book, Harley, generally speaking, gets a lot less emotional and psychological development than she does in her own solo stories. Outside of Suicide Squad, Harley also has a couple of other notable appearances in books that I'm not so familiar with. There's DC's Bombshells, which I think is based on a line of figurines, which does have the distinction of being a notable place where Harley and Poison Ivy's relationship became explicitly 
wildly romantic. Harley has also been teamed up with Catwoman and Poison Ivy in Gotham City Sirens, a series that ran like in the late 2000s, I think. In the book, the three of them basically team up and live together and occasionally run into the Joker as well, but the series is much more about Harley's relationship to Poison Ivy and to Catwoman. In the pantheon of comic book characters, Harley Quinn is one character who has had a remarkably consistent characterization across all of the appearances, at least the ones I could find. She's only really been through one major reboot, and that was the New 52, which is, you know, yet another reality-spanning reboot of the entire DC universe, which is not something anyone gets excited for these days. But Harley came out on the other side of it pretty much the same way that she went in, albeit with a bunch of backstory and little details about her relationship, especially with the Joker retconned in and out of existence. Anyway, Anyway, canon is an abyss, and this is about as much of the comics as I'm willing to cover, so let's move on to something a little bit more notable. So, this should be a relatively shorter segment. Of the notable video games where Harley Quinn appears as, like, an actual character, pretty much the Arkham Asylum games and the Telltale Batman games are it. In the Arkham games, she's pretty much just a direct port of her personality from the animated series, albeit with the intensity turned up and made a little bit darker and grittier, as befits the aesthetic and worldview of the games. The Telltale series does something a lot more interesting and different with Harley Quinn. Because that series of games is largely also an origin story for the Joker, Harley isn't turned into Harley by anything the Joker does. Instead, it's arguably the other way around. In this version, Harley Quinn is still a former psychiatrist from Arkham, but one who saw her father go insane and take his own life due to a hereditary mental illness, which she is obsessed with curing in herself. To that end, she gets involved with Bruce Wayne and Bruce Wayne's friend John Doe, the man who will eventually become the Joker, and through the process of that involvement, Harley Quinn is at least partially responsible for the creation of of the Joker, which is an interesting reversal and creates a very different power dynamic between the two characters. Telltale's Harley Quinn is much more of a straight-up supervillain than her animated series or comics counterpart. This lady is a straight-up murderous badass psychopath with none of the romantic mooning over the Joker that characterizes her in other incarnations. Unfortunately, with the demise of Telltale Games, it's highly unlikely we'll ever see a follow-up to this version of Harley Quinn. At least, not unless the reanimated corpse of the company that's currently shambling around in the market somehow manages to get their hands on the license for that particular character again. Now, that more or less covers the games, so now let's talk about the movies, specifically Suicide Squad and Birds of Prey. Now, Suicide Squad is kind of a mangled train wreck of a movie that, that went through multiple rounds of editing and reshooting, and consequently, pretty much no character walks out of it with anything like a strong or interesting characterization. They mostly import Harley directly from the comic books, but rather than Harley and the Joker having a really tempestuous, toxic relationship, they are portrayed somewhat more like ongoing romantic partners, but because Leto's Joker is both awful and kind of a non-presence in the film as a whole, it's kind of hard to see if their relationship is conceptualized in any way that's meaningfully distinct from the ways in which she's portrayed in the comics. This has supposedly changed rather substantially in the Birds of Prey film, which at the time of making this video I haven't had the chance to see for myself, but going by what I can find in terms of reviews and critical analysis on the internet, in the Birds of Prey movie, Harley has apparently decisively broken up with the Joker, and according to some reports, she's also canonically confirmed to be at the very least bisexual, which I would imagine is probably laying the groundwork for a possible team up with Poison Ivy sometime in the future. Outside of that, Harley also has a relatively high-profile new series all of her own called, literally, Harley Quinn. The TV series gives Harley a modern Suicide Squad-inspired character design, but seems to mostly adopt storylines from the original run of Harley Quinn comic books. It reconceptualizes her relationship with the Joker less as a horrifying domestic abuse situation and more like the Joker is like her sh ex-college boyfriend who, like, negs her and really snipes at her self-esteem in between rounds of trying to semi-comically trying to murder her. But the power dynamic between the two characters is generally portrayed as somewhat more even than in the classic version of Harley Quinn. The new animated series also portrays the gimmick of having Harley basically have a personality split between Harleen Quinzel, the sober-minded analytical psychiatrist who understands what's happening to Harley and has the ability to self-reflect, and the ditzy, impulsive, cartoonish, comical, silly clown Harley Quinn persona. Harley's characterization in the animated series is essentially a kind of modernization of the classic Harley Quinn. It seems explicitly designed to give Harley back a lot more agency over her own story, recasting her as an angry, fed-up everywoman tired of being taken advantage of by the sh no. men that surround her, whether those men happen to be named Joker or the Batman. 
Whew, okay, all right, that was more or less a general overview of the different versions of Harley Quinn that exist, as well as her origins in the animated series. Like I said, I've had to ignore or skim over a whole heck of a lot of the character's history, especially in the comics, in order to fit it all into one video, but if you know of a particularly interesting part of Harley's history that I didn't mention here, feel free to leave it down in the comments for other people to enjoy. As for us, with a few notable versions of the Harley Quinn character established, we can finally move on to... When it comes to Harley Quinn's character design, obviously there is a thousand and one different versions out there. Especially in the comics, different artists, different editors, different writers might alter or edit her character design according to their needs. In the films, Harley has more than one costume, more than one look, same goes to the Arkham Asylum games, and Telltale Harley is a different beast from the rest of them entirely. So in order to narrow this down, we're gonna deal with four different character designs for Harley Quinn specifically. Her classic animated series Harlequin outfit, her current modernized comic book outfit, which is also pretty much the same as the one she has in her new animated series, her character design in the DC movies, and finally, a general overview of how she looks when she's playing the part not of Harley Quinn, but of Dr. Harleen Quinzel. And we'll start with Dr. Quinzel, because she is one of the most consistent parts of Harley's visual design across pretty much all of her incarnations. Here she is in the animated series, here she is in the Suicide Squad comics, here she is in the Suicide Squad movie, and here she is in Stjepan Sejik's, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, recent Harley-focused retelling of her origin story, Harleen, for DC's Black Label. Harleen Quinzel is Harley Quinn's starting point. She is the thing against which Harley Quinn's clown-like appearance is meant to contrast. She is the normalcy that Harley has been diverted from. Every Harley Quinn character design is in some way a subversion or a reaction against Harleen Quinzel. And so it's relevant to ask, well, well, visually speaking, who or what is Harleen Quinzel? What is this thing that they're reacting against? And the answer to that is kind of boring and generic. Harleen Quinzel is a beautiful, attractive young woman, but also not especially remarkable or interesting to look at. She rarely wears anything in terms of especially identifiable clothes or costume. She doesn't wear anything in terms of jewelry. She doesn't really have any kind of adornment. There is nothing extra about her. She's typically portrayed with her long hair tied up in some sort of a bun, the universal visual language of being repressed, the opposite of letting your hair down. She's typically dressed in a white lab coat over a painfully generic office casual professional businesswoman style outfit. Often a pencil skirt, sometimes a shirt, sometimes some kind of blazer, usually high heels. And combine that with the glasses and you get a character who is like 90% the archetypal boring librarian stereotype. All of this is of course in service of highlighting the contrast between who she is as a baseline and who the Joker ultimately transforms her into. And on that level, it kind of makes sense that that nobody seems to ever really want to bother reinventing Harleen Quinzel. Because any attempt of radical reinvention would inevitably make her more interesting, which would lessen the impact of the contrast between Dr. Harleen Quinzel, psychiatrist, and Harley Quinn, psychotic supercriminal. So let's look at the very first incarnation of that, Harley Quinn in the animated series. And this is probably where we should really start with the Harlequin, the classical theater character from whom Harley Quinn's name and entire costume is derived. And the first thing to know about that is that outside of the visuals and the name and a few details, there really isn't that much of a connection between Harley Quinn and the historical Harlequin. The Harlequin is a stock character archetype, from a style of theater called Commedia dell'arte, which, as you can probably tell from my terrible pronunciation, is Italian. It was popular between the 16th and the 18th centuries in Europe primarily, and became tremendously influential in the history of theater. It relied on a number of stock archetypes who could then be put into different story scenarios and play out relatively predictable tropes, storylines, and scenarios. Anyway, the Harlequin is a stock archetype who's usually cast in the role of some kind of manservant or some kind of minor character who causes comedic mischief to the agendas of the other characters. The Harlequin is typically a tumbler or an acrobat, which is something that Harley Quinn has borrowed from that particular kind of character. But beyond that, he, and it is almost always a he, is generally portrayed as a kind of lecherous trickster personality. Fond of eating and drinking, getting in the pants of all the girls, always running some kind of a scam. So beyond the name and the costume and being an athletic character, there really isn't that much of a connection to go from. Harley Quinn is much more of a modern invention than a throwback. 
So, starting with basics, Harley Quinn wears white makeup in imitation of the Joker, but her skin isn't actually bleached by chemicals like his is. She's putting on an act to imitate him, to be more like him. Her split in personality is communicated very succinctly through her costume, which has a deeply obvious split between red and black that runs throughout the entire thing. A reference, of course, both to the suits of cards, red and black, and to the fact that Harley Quinn remains a split character herself, between the silly, ditzy, kind of airheaded sidekick and the brilliant side psychiatrist who was supplanted by that new persona. Now, Harley Quinn's design in the animated series is deliberately as simple as possible because, well, it had to be animated and animation runs on a budget. One of the brilliant things about the art style that Bruce Timm and his team came up with for Batman the Animated Series is that it has a consistent, simplified and highly stylized visual language that makes it, relatively speaking, simpler and less work intensive and therefore cheaper to animate relatively complex character designs. One of the weaknesses of that particular style, though, is that it has some trouble rendering characters with higher levels of detail and tends to fall back on visual archetypes and tropes, which is why, like, every other woman in Gotham City has exactly the same body type as Harley Quinn, despite her being an incredibly well-trained gymnast and most other people presumably, you know, not being that. Harley's mask is another clever little touch because the contrast between the white of her eyes and the blackness of the mask is used at multiple occasions during her animation to highlight the expressiveness of her eyes and strengthen the general expression of her face. The simplicity of the original animated series Harley Quinn design made it rather rapidly iconic. It's a striking design and its simplicity makes it highly efficient, but it is also ultimately a sidekick character design. Remember, Harley Quinn was originally designed and conceived as just an incidental sidekick to the Joker. And so that's kind of what she ends up looking like, a generic henchman to a clown-themed villain. It's by no means a bad design, but unlike the Joker, who regularly subverts his killer clown image by wearing the fine suits of an underground mob store or various other costumes, Harley is already so thoroughly in costume that you kinda can't really add or edit anything about this iconic look without you know, depriving it of its iconicness. And this, of course, makes kind of a narrative point about Harley Quinn. She is ultimately wearing a costume that's forced on her by the Joker, by his personality, by his aesthetic. But it also means that without the costume, there is no Harley Quinn. The costume as a whole constitutes pretty much the entirety of her visual identity. Now, these aren't really problems or criticisms because all of that works perfectly within the show, but it goes some way towards explaining why, in media that is focused on Harley outside of just her relationship with the Joker, writers and artists have felt a clear need to reinvent her into something that's more personal to her. Which is a good note to move on to her design in the Suicide Squad and Birds of Prey movies. In Suicide Squad, Harley Quinn is still very much the Joker's girl. And this is reflected in her costuming choices. She's got the daddy's little monster top, the choker that spells out Putin, which is her pet name for the Joker, the fishnets, the ridiculously short cut off hot pants, all of it tying into the character that she plays as the Joker's girlfriend, hypersexualized, sexually aggressive, devoted to her man, and dressing herself up pretty much entirely for his benefit in order to please his visual aesthetic. In the Birds of Prey movie, where the plot revolves around her having broken up with the Joker and therefore being vulnerable to retribution from all of the Joker's enemies, Harley dresses in a way that seems much more about expressing her particular aesthetic and identity quirks rather than playing the part of hot girlfriend or sex symbol for the Joker. And I want to stress, this isn't strictly a comparison between good and bad character design. Like, I think Harley Quinn in Suicide Squad is designed perfectly for the character that she's playing in that movie. Now, I think Suicide Squad is a complete shambles of a movie, and I think its version of Harley Quinn is boring and tropey and not very interesting, but given the context of the movie, the design works for the purpose that it's supposed to serve. Like, if you wanted a version of Harley Quinn as a hypersexual, grunge, manic, pixie dream girl, yeah, sure, that's what it would look like. But that particular look would wouldn't work in Birds of Prey because in Birds of Prey she's playing a different version of the character that has different priorities. So rather than wearing a choker that says Puddin, she wears a shirt that literally says Harley Quinn on it to show in a rather ham-fisted way that she has transitioned from being air quotes owned by the Joker to being owned by herself. She's by no means desexualized, but she has transitioned from a kind of grungy, sexy pinup aesthetic to more of a riot girl, acid trip, punk clown aesthetic. Personally, I find that version more interesting than the Suicide Squad version because it implies more of Harley's internal life rather than the role she plays relative to others. And that moves us on at last to Harley's modern look in the comic books and indeed in her animated series. 
The modern Harley Quinn look was introduced along with the new 52 back in 2011, but its first appearance in her own comic happened in 2014. This version keeps the red and black split from her classic costume, but switches out the clown outfit to something a lot more gothy slash punky. So she's wearing a leather jacket, knee pads, a bustier with plenty of cleavage, hot pants, thigh-high socks, and tall leather boots. This new aesthetic serves a couple of purposes. For one thing, it takes her decisively out of the orbit of the Joker. The Joker has always been theatrical, a performer, larger than life. But Harley's new aesthetic is decidedly more modern, urban, grounded, and down to earth. It casts Harley less as an ascended henchman to a crazy costume supervillain with a gimmick, and gives her a distinct aesthetic while positioning her more in the visual terms of a modern young woman struggling to find her place in the world, than in the world of costume superheroes and villains fighting over the fate of the universe. This version of Harley unwinds from assassination attempts and adventures with robots from the future by going to roller derbies, or having a spa day with Poison Ivy. Now, like all the superhero characters, Harley wears multiple costumes over the course of her adventure, but the only sort of persistent change to her look from the 2014 reboot has been a change in her hairstyle, changing out the strict black and red for a pink and blue dip dye of her pigtails. This is also the aesthetic that carries into the new animated series, which seems to be culling themes and storylines from across Harley Quinn's solo comic appearances, but consolidating them into serving the main odd couple dynamic with her and Poison Ivy, and the general satirization of the DC Comics universe that's happening in that show. Now, on a personal level, I'll probably always prefer Harley Quinn's classic animated series look, but that's probably mostly out of nostalgia. The modern designs for Harley Quinn do a great job of redesigning the character for the context that she's supposed to fit in. I would argue that the original animated series look is definitely the most iconic look she's ever had, but its simplicity and its stark commitment to being a costume meant that it wasn't really up for the challenges that modern storytelling about this character had to face. Oh god, this video is way too long already, that's what I get for trying to do a superhero character. And as with every previous segment, we can't cover all of the themes and all of the stories that have ever been told about and around Harley Quinn in this segment, because I really do want to finish this video sometime this year. So we'll limit ourselves to two major themes that seem to recur across various versions of the character. And the major one, of course, is the abusive relationship with the Joker. Sometimes it's mostly played for comedy, with the Joker and Harley as a kind of bickering on-again, off-again couple who occasionally try to murder each other. And then other times, it's played very, very straight indeed. Stepjan Sejic's Harleen especially dives very deep into the awful psychology of that kind of an abusive relationship. To me though, perhaps the best portrayal of the relationship is still that original animated series episode Mad Love, because it makes the astute observation that Harley would make a much better criminal mastermind than the Joker. Especially in the animated series, the Joker always self-sabotages because of his narcissism, because of his ego, and his incessant need to always be right and always beat the bat. But Harley, on the other hand, is a highly motivated, well-educated, intelligent young woman who successfully uses her skills of manipulation to lure the bat into a trap from which he has no plausible escape. When the Joker shows up, he's livid with Harley despite everything she's done for him because he only cares about her as a means to his own ends, to his own glorification. He likes Harley to be the ditz, the blonde, the silly sidekick that he can slap around when he feels angry. The moment she's about to have an accomplishment of her own, even one for which she's willing to give him all of the credit, she becomes a threat to his ego and he tries to destroy her. But of course, because the Joker is an insatiable narcissist, he can't resist taking credit for her accomplishment anyway. And just as Batman planned, letting his ego screw it up because he's not as good a criminal as Harley Quinn. And there is a serious point in that about the nature of their relationship. The Joker is a parasite. He latches onto her, seduces her, uses her, never gives her anything that she wants, and the moment he cannot dominate her, the moment he perceives a threat to his ego, he tries to destroy her. And all of this is very true of not all abusive relationships, but certainly the kind that's portrayed between Joker and Harley. Yes, it's heightened and cartoony and somewhat exaggerated, but this is a relationship dynamic that exists in real life and that real people suffer under, men and women both. Which I think is what makes this version of Harley Quinn and this story so influential. It portrays something that is terribly real through the safe distance of a comic book cartoony superhero narrative. Which is one of the brilliant things about 
the animated series. One of the things that it did so well was use the fact that it is a cartoon, that it is a little bit distant, to get away with telling stories that actually touch on real things that affect real people. Knowledge and representation which can genuinely help some people make it through very bad stages in their lives. As much praise as I have for the mad love story, that horrifying relationship between the Joker and Harley, it also comes with some limitations built in that every version of Harley Quinn has had to reckon with at some point. The original mad love story ends as a tragedy. Harley has been thrown out of a window by the Joker, nearly killed, and is recovering in Arkham when she sees that he has sent her a single red rose and a get well card. And instantly, all of the trauma, all of the misery, all of the pain and suffering flies out of her mind and is replaced once again with that mad love, the obsession with the Joker. The dark tragedy is that she's trapped in this cycle of self-destruction, which again is very real. Abusive relationships in real life are often characterized by repeating cycles of abuse. But the thing about that is that if the only story you ever tell about Harley Quinn is one of her being abused, trying to escape the relationship and getting suffering, back in over and over and over again and she never moves on from that. The implicit message of your storytelling is that escaping abusive relationships is impossible, that once you're in, you're doomed to repeat the cycle forever. And this is probably why most modern stories about Harley Quinn don't like to dwell too much on the Mad Love storyline. In the new animated series and all of her comics and the Birds of Prey movie, Harley Quinn as a character has, to various degrees, moved on from the Joker. Some of the stories tackles the aftermath of that relationship, what it's done to Harley to be trapped in that kind of a situation for so long. Some of them play around with her still having a kind of romantic attachment to the Joker that she's sort of halfway in denial about, and others try to move on from from that relationship completely, putting it squarely in the past and giving Harley new problems to tackle. Which leads us neatly on to one of the other storylines that has been pretty consistent across various characterizations of Harley Quinn after the original animated series, and that is some version of living with mental problems. Harley is fairly consistently portrayed as someone who is some level of disassociated from reality. In her original comic run, for example, she tends to see the world through a kind of Harley vision, almost like in built rose-tinted glasses where she sees everything just as a little bit nicer and a little bit happier and a little bit more light-hearted than it really is. With the prime example being an early storyline where she shoots one of her loyal henchmen dead because he's interfering with her plan and then leaves him to bleed out and die because she literally cannot see that he has been mortally wounded. In her head, everything is just fine and there aren't any negative ramifications to her behavior. In the original run of Harley Quinn comic books, that eventually comes to a head in the very last storyline of the comic where Harley makes a decision that condemns a child that she has some level of relationship with to blindness for the rest of her life. And finally, the weight and the guilt of all of the things that she has done come crashing down on her hard enough that she goes to Arkham Asylum voluntarily and has herself committed. And it remains an overarching part of Harley's character in the comics that she's dealing with some level of either mental illness or trauma that she's desperately trying to avoid having to process. This perhaps comes most to the fore in the current run of her solo comic, where Harley is dealing, or rather entirely failing, to deal with the fallout from the death of her mother. Oh yeah, by the way, Harley has an extended family. That was also something that they introduced in the comics, and she has predictably some difficult to toxic relationships with most of them. Anyway, Harley is so desperate to avoid dealing with the trauma of her mother dying that she goes on a time-traveling crossover adventure with Booster Gold trying to alter the very fabric of reality and prevent comic book crossovers from happening by stopping the DC crisis events from becoming like a thing. It's all a very Deadpool-style meta gag, but the underlying idea is one of Harley trying to prevent things from becoming too serious, which is usually what happens in the crisis and the massive crossover event books is that someone dies or some universe is ended or some big upheaval in the story happens. Harley is essentially trying to turn things back to the way they were when her mother was still alive. And the split between Harley Quinn and Harleen Quinzel is also a consistent theme across the different stories about this character. The Harleen Quinzel persona usually shows up in serious situations when Harley has to deal with some kind of trauma that she can no longer ignore, repress, or set aside. It's her inner voice of reason. And in some versions of the character, even implicitly, 
the true core of Harley Quinn herself. Harley Quinn is a character created essentially by trauma. A trauma which she is in the constant process of trying to recover from and move on from. And through that lens, Harleen Quinzel represents a kind of idealized self, the person that on some level, she kind of wishes she could return to being. Essentially a normal version of herself, a version without the trauma, without the pain, without the misery and struggle. Interestingly though, the new animated series takes a very different approach to this whole idea. In episode 5, Being Harley Quinn, Harley is overcome with a crisis of identity. She's unable to make a decision about who she is or who she wants to be as a supervillain within the conceit of the show. So, with the help of a psychic supervillain, Ivy and Harley's other friends dive into Harley's mind where they find Harley struggling with a glitch in her origin story. She has convinced herself that the Joker created her by pushing her into a vat of acid, bleaching her skin and creating Harley Quinn. In her mind, it wasn't her choice to become a villain, it wasn't her choice for anything that happened in her life to happen, someone else made her that way. But by exploring her memories, she comes to realize that the Joker didn't create her that day. He didn't didn't push her into the acid. She jumped of her own accord. She made herself. And so, inside her own museum of memories, she changes her origin story. She stops defining herself by the moment when she jumped into the acid and became the Joker's girlfriend, Harley Quinn, and starts defining herself by the moment that she kicked his ass and rejected everything about his influence over her. This is a radically different take on the character that restores Harley to a complete agency over her own story. Her transformation into Harley Harley Quinn is no longer a tragic accident or a trauma to be overcome, but a transformation she chose to undergo. So is this a better way to deal with it than the classic story? Well, that's a little bit of yes and no, I think. Because I think the original story and the original version of Harley Quinn is well told, especially in the animated series, and also kind of important, actually. Like, yes, it comes with problems and potential downsides, but that version of the character spoke to a hell of a lot of people. And that version of the story is a huge part of the reason why Harley Quinn became popular and well-loved enough that people even wanted to bother making these revisionisms and reinterpretations of the character. On the other hand, that original version of the story is almost a quarter of a century old now, and at this point the meaning of Harley Quinn as a character has shifted and evolved with multiple storytellers and multiple mediums taking a turn at trying to define her as something other than just her origin story. So again, in the context of there being a need for Harley Quinn to be a character who exists independently of other characters, who has her own mythology, her own backstory, who isn't beholden to anyone else more popular than her for her relevance. Yeah, I do think reframing her origin story in a way that gives her explicit control over herself, her story, what she wants and who she is, is a pretty sensible move. Harley Quinn was an accident, an incidental character who was supposed to be there for one scene in order to fulfill one purpose, and who stuck around through a combination of convenience and because something about her touched a nerve in the writers. And because they gave her more time to breathe and more time to develop, she became popular with the viewers as well. She was a true organic outgrowth of the animated series, and as we got to know her story better, she became kind of a perfect representation of everything that made Batman the animated series great in the first place. Her dark and painfully real toxic relationship with the Joker exemplified the ways in which the animated series managed to take very dark, very real and truly dramatic material and sneak it under the radar of the censors into something that should have been just a silly children's cartoon but which ended up meaning a hell of a lot to a hell of a lot of people and defining much of the future of the DC animated universe. Her episodes and friendship with Poison Ivy especially did a lot to deepen both characters and has been a major part of what has made them both fan favorites up until this day. And that's one of the magical things about Harley Quinn, really. She didn't really come from anywhere. She sprang out of Batman the Animated Series all on her own, on the strength of her own design and personality. She has meant a whole lot to a whole lot of people, and she still means a whole lot to a whole lot of people today. But honestly, when you get right down to it, the big deal about Harley Quinn is that she's just a really f cool character. Whatever 
peculiar alchemy that happened to put her together in the 90s, whatever odd set of circumstances, they hit on a character with a fantastic combination of vulnerability and power, fragility and strength, who's as fascinating as a traumatized emotional wreck as she is as a kick-ass anti-hero. That's a rare quality, especially in a superhero character. It's the kind of thing that we usually praise, you know, Batman for. So at the end of this very long video that took way longer than I thought to put together, my conclusion is that Harley Quinn is just freaking cool, man. Hey, thank you very much for watching another episode of What's the Deal With. I swear to God, I'm never doing another superhero again. Do you know how much stuff is in those goddamn wikis? It's a lot. It's so much. There is a bizarro Harley Quinn somehow. Why is there a bizarro Harley Quinn? What was she even in? Why did someone make that? Oh, I don't know. It's superhero comics. Okay, it's on the wiki. Guess I have to know about it now. And that's not even getting started on, like, the crisis stuff with Earth 1 and Earth 2 and the new Earth and the crisis reboot thing with the planet is all merging together or not merging together. Hell if I know. Never doing a superhero episode again, ever. Never doing it until I forget how much of work this was and decide, hey, what if I do one about Superman and then this starts all over again. Anyway, if you have enjoyed this episode, and God, I hope you have, because it was a lot of work to put together, then I would very much appreciate it if you hit the like button down below. Maybe also subscribe, hit the bell icon, and the reason I ask you for that is because YouTube tracks how many people hit the like button and the subscribe button and the bell icon, and it checks whether the numbers on my channel are going up or down, and if they're going up, everything is fine, I get to keep my channel, I get to keep making videos, everybody's happy, and if they're going down, it, I don't know, they probably send assassins to kill me or something, I don't know what happens, but I don't want to find out, please make the numbers go up. Uh, and if you want to support me more directly than just making the numbers go up, then you can head on over to Patreon, where you can sign up for a donation at any level that you might want to, or you can use one of my tip jars down in the description to give me a one-time tip to say, hey, good job on the Harley Quinn thing, that was sure a lot of stuff about superheroes, which, I don't know, maybe you want to give me a tip for that, it's, it, weirder things have happened. I also have a merchandise store if you're inclined to check out that sort of thing, and if not, that's completely okay. If you don't want to support me directly, I'm completely fine with it. That. Believe me, I get it. The thing I do try to encourage people to do, though, at the end of my videos, is if there is an online content creator whose work you do enjoy, please consider supporting them directly with anything you can, whenever you can. Like, a $1 donation can literally be the same as thousands of views on a video, especially for channels that make niche content that isn't very popular with the advertising algorithms. So, whether it's me or someone else, if there is content online that you enjoy and you want there to be more of it and for it to continue into the future, please consider donating anything you can, whenever you can, because it makes so much more of a difference than you think. Okay, last thing I have to plug, I promise. I also have a second channel. I do Let's Plays over there, where I try to also do character design analysis and story analysis and all that good stuff. And occasionally I stream on that channel as well. Currently we're doing Nier Automata. So, you know, if that sounds interesting, please go over there and make the numbers on that channel go up as well. Because seriously, I'm kind of scared to find out what happens if they go down. Anyway, if you haven't enjoyed this video, then there is a dislike button down below. And oh, I know you've been told all your life that the nice thing to do is to hit the like button, not to hit the dislike button. Oh, you've been told to play by the rules, but aren't you tired of being nice? Don't you just want to go a little bit mad? <laughs> Ha 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 